Meeting will come to order. Good evening and welcome to this Tuesday, July 19th, 2016, Mercer Island City Council meeting. Allie, could you call the roll? Mayor Bruce Bassett. Here. Deputy Mayor Debbie Bertland. Councilmember Dan Grouse. Here. Councilmember Jeff Sanderson. Here. Councilmember Wendy Weicker. Here. Councilmember David Wiesentiner. Councilmember Benson Wong. Here. Okay, very good. Uh, First item of business is agenda approval. Is there any desire to change the agenda for this evening? It's mercifully short. I'm hoping it stays that way. So moved. <laughs> All right. Is there a second? Seconded? Second. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Oh, aye. Okay. Opposed? Motion carries. We come to appearances, a time when anybody may address the council on any issue they wish. You have uh, three minutes. Please begin by introducing yourself, giving your address. Steve, you are ready to roll. I'm ready to roll. And uh, the general rules of uh, conduct are uh, on the back wall, but uh, all boils down to just please be civil. I'm familiar with them. What's that? How come you're not in Cleveland? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you think, uh, let's, let's not get to uh, political, please. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. I hope it doesn't go off my time. <laughs> no. So I'm Steve Marshall, 8150 West Mercer Way. Uh, I serve two terms on the Planning Commission, and I have a request tonight to make uh, to you in connection with the Mercer Island uh, Episcopal uh, Rectory, the Emmanuel Episcopal Rectory. Lucia will talk about that a little bit more, but my request is that we do with the religious institutions on Mercer Island, the churches, synagogues, and other institutions, what we did with the schools while I was on the Planning Commission, which is to put them into a zone of their own and, and to deal with issues uh, that come up under the First Amendment and other issues that apply to all the churches, like the issues applied to the schools. Uh, we don't have to decide what those are, but I think uh, having a framework where all of the churches, uh, synagogues, and other institutions are within a single type of zoning makes it easier to address those issues that are unique to those institutions. Um, as Lucia will express, we're, we're running into some issues with a, a rectory, which basically is low-income housing. You, know, you want people who work on Mercer Island to live on Mercer Island. It's very difficult to do. Uh, we'll give you more details on that later. There are other institutions, I understand, St. Monica's looking at uh, what they might want to do with housing for uh, some of their uh, staff and so forth. But uh, rather than do the details, I think the framework would be good if we could have uh, an overall zoning like we did with schools. And it really doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Pretty simple uh, set of issues. You do that framework and then you can address the sub-issues that come after that. Um, I'll talk to the, the Planning Commission too, but I think the, the basic idea would be to have the Council request the Planning Commission to come up with an overall framework uh, for this and then to develop rules later on as they might apply to um, uh, the various things that, that might come out of the uh, uh, overall look. And, and that look may take a while to find out what are the issues, are they impervious surface issues, are they uh, other zoning type issues that, uh, like what we did with the schools, which is we reduced the uh, requirement on impervious surfaces to allow the schools to have a little more latitude. So that would be one example of something that could be developed later. But the overall framework is what I'm trying to get at today without going into the details. So Lucia has, uh, I think, submitted something to the council members. I think our, our current uh, rector, uh, uh, Hunt Priest, who is actually leaving and has kind of detail some of what he had to do when I lived on the island. He had moved five times in rental housing. It was a very difficult situation. And so we're trying to build a rectory to uh, alleviate that condition so that we can recruit the, the next person because Hunt's leaving. My time's up, but thank you for listening. And I'll also send around uh, a little uh, write-up on the request that I have. But, but it's an easy request. Uh, it should get underway as soon as you can. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Lucia Pierzio Bierley, 4212 West Mercer Way. Uh, you have probably received, or I'm sure you've received my comments from earlier today. Um, 
<clears throat> As the architect for the Emanuel Episcopal Church Rectory, um, I'm here to speak to you tonight about the catch-22 between of a re residential project being caught in the definition of an institutional zoning. Um, the rectory will sit on an undivided parcel of land owned by the church, so whereas it is a single-family project for all intents and purposes, it will be considered institutional from a land use perspective. It will adhere to the requirements of a single family use as far as building design, construction, fire suppression are concerned. The city will require the church to pay the new school impact fee of $14,000 for a new single family residential project in addition to all other permit fees and the variance fees. For land use purposes, it will be considered an institution and because the overall site law site will have a lot coverage greater than 40 percent it is required to undergo an impervious surface variation variance sorry the particular variance this particular variance is a moment where the definition between a lot coverage deviation for residential versus an impervious surface variance for institutional blurs the definitions and the issue goes from being one of zoning to that of engineering. This has forced the detention requirements to an increase to increase the tank size four times, going from an eight thousand to ten thousand dollar scope to five to six times the cost. Furthermore, the church is required to replace an an area of adjacent parking lot with pervious paving equal in area to the imper new impervious surface, another significant cost. And this giant tank, I mean, it's enormous, will significantly uh, disrupt the natural hydrology of the site. We, when we submitted the variance, um, we, we did it adhering to the requirements of the city in the, in, with the intention of circling back later to find an alternate so solution more in line with the scope of work and budget of the project. The hearing examiner stated that this seemed an unfortunate result of city policy with un unforeseen impacts at the time of its formulation. We believe this is an unintended consequence of policy that was implemented to put, out, put onus on developers who are significantly increasing stormwater runoff on the island with their high impact development. In the case of the church, the impact of the institutional scale detention system required is inconsistent with the scope of proposed work and adjacent development and could result in shutting down the project altogether, which is intended to affordably house the record of a church that provides significant benefit to this community beyond its um, direct con congregation. We anticipate other, res other ins religious institutions will want to provide affordable housing for their leaders in a community where no such thing exists. We ask you to request, we ask you request the Planning Commission add the evaluation of an exception to lot coverage variance for residential projects on institutional properties to their work calendar as they consider revisions to the development code so that their pastors, priests, rabbis, and imams can be affordably housed in the community they are serving. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'm uh, closing public comments. Thank you. Uh, process for, Pam, can you just talk for a moment about process for scoping the residential code um, yes. uh, public effort? Yes, the, um, the scope uh, is going through the Planning Commission and we'll be coming back to the Council at the August 1st meeting, the scope and the schedule for doing the residential code work. And so we're, it's being suggested we direct the Planning Commission as to what the scope is. It's starting with Planning Commission coming to Council and then the Council will set it and it goes back to the Planning Commission for yes. its effort, is that right? Yes, so that the Planning Commission and the so the council has the opportunity to approve the scope and add, change, whatever, before okay. it goes back to the Planning Commission. Okay. So citizens who have an interest in this could talk to the Planning Commission at their next meeting, which is yeah. tomorrow. Uh, they could talk to the council at our next meeting. Yes. Uh, or they could talk now as, as to have, and uh, those would all be good input points. So. Yes, okay. correct. Okay, thank you. All right, we move to the consent calendar. We have payables, payroll, and three sets of minutes. Is there a motion to accept the consent calendar? Second. 
All right, moved and seconded. Is there anybody who wishes to pull anything? All right, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We'll move to regular business, Agenda Bill 5203, Booster Chlorination Station Project. From Jason, I am assuming you're going to start us off here and introduce your panel of folks. Is that right? Correct. All right. We are here tonight to talk about the booster chlorination station project. Good. Yep. Can we start over? All right. For the record, Jason Kenner, Public Works Director. We're here tonight to talk about the booster chlorination station project. Um, it was proposed to you guys, to the council, um, the last council meeting, as part of the 2017-2018 uh, CIP project. Uh, with me tonight is Brian McDaniel, our Utility Operations Manager, Antonella Howe, our Assistant City Engineer, Derek Pell, and Brianna Carter behind us here from Department of Health. She's wise. We've got room. So tonight we have about 10 slides to get through, and I'm sure you guys have plenty of questions for us on this. Uh, you'll recall back in January we came to you with a water system plan, or uh, not a water system plan, we came back to you with a uh, post-world water event uh, response in terms of what progress had been made. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about some additional follow-up and then specifically about the booster chlorination project. So we have a graphic of how water gets to the island. Uh, we are provided water from Seattle Public Utilities. Uh, on the right hand portion of the slide we have the uh, Cascade Eastside supply pipe. The pipe is owned by Seattle Public Utilities. It comes across, moving to the left, across the Mercer Slough and it splits and it comes across the bridge, I-90 bridge. Joins back together on the Inatai Point in Bellevue comes across land and then it splits again with a 16 inch pipe that actually is attached to the East Channel Bridge. And then parallel to that, going underneath the East Channel, we have an SPU pipe that goes under the channel and it converges at the boat ramp. That pink or purple line, if you will, is owned by SPU and that pipe continues up to the reservoir point. Uh, something noteworthy along that pipe, uh, Mercer Island, we have a slide later that will kind of illustrate the different points where the water actually comes off of that pipe. Uh, but along that 24-inch pipe on the way to the reservoir, it also supplies water to Shorewood. There is a meter at the boat ramp that supplies the blue line that goes along East Mercer Way that also terminates at the reservoir. Uh, there is a second meter on that on the way up to the reservoir which is 40th and 92nd area and then finally there's a third meter at the reservoir point so i'm sorry if before you go on you talked about so you talked about i, I just want to understand the difference between red and blue here or, or whatever you're calling so help help me when you said the, there's a line tell me what the difference between the red line and the blue line is so that i understand those that's a good question. So the, the blue line is a line that is connected directly to the meter at the boat ramp. And that is owned by the city of Mercer Island. So the blue line is direct ownership of the city of Mercer Island. All the way out along I-90 to Factoria? It actually stops uh, at the boat ramp. They use blue in the graphic. The red line takes a 93 angle on Mercer Island. The blue line is a distribution line. I'll try to get this laser pointer to work. So at this point right here, both the pipe here that goes underneath the East Channel and the one that comes across on the bridge where they converge, they converge that's separate from this blue line. It is actually separate. The, and then this line is SPUs. So, so after these two converge, so the, the two lines coming across, one underwater and one on the bridge, are SPU lines? That's correct. They get to the, the point at the boat ramp, they merge? They merge. And it would be better to show this as if it were 
all pink right there, okay. indicating all of Seattle Public Utilities. And I hope I have a slide that might further explain this a little bit later of how the water actually flows and kind of some of the pressure zones within the. Okay. And then the blue line going down East Mercer Way is a Mercer Island line, and the red line coming across is the SPU line. Yeah. Okay. Effectively, if we had a water meter right here, that would be feeding water off of the pink line to the blue line. We own the blue line. Okay. If that helps. Yeah. Thank you. That blue line, the, the blue line is, you said it goes back to the reservoir. Does it? The water that is serving the people on that blue line is that coming from the reservoir or coming from Seattle? Coming from the Seattle line. That's a great question as well. And so that pipe actually does have transmission off of it. And then I have another slide that will hopefully explain this a little bit better. But that is not connected. It is not receiving water out of the reservoir tank itself. It is not receiving water out of the reservoir tank itself. But it connects Sorry. to the reservoir, so anything It fills the reservoir in a different pressure zone. So anyone who, okay. 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 Thank you. So post boil water, um, the city worked with Confluence Engineering uh, and Department of Health to come up with our, essentially our mitigation, our response, our coliform uh, response action plan. And you've, you're familiar with this graphic. Uh, the, green items, the green items are completed uh, components of our reaction plan, the response plan. Uh, the black remain to be completed. Uh, most of them are underway. There's two key elements that uh, we'll carry into next year, and we're here to talk about one of them tonight with the booster chlorination station. And then the other piece that we'll carry into next year, the next uh, the next round, is the phase three of the retrofit of the standalone vaults. So there's seven vaults that are larger scale. We have to uh, engineer a design specification for that, um, and those are projected to be completed in 2017. Uh, with both of these projects being uh, hopefully completed uh, in the next budget by NEM, we should be done with our response action plan completely by the end of the 2018 year. You're familiar, we talked about a many, many of these issues or many of these items uh, back in January, um, but it's, it, it's important to note that um, post boil water staff's knowledge of our distribution system, of our water quality monitoring, um, just of our water operations has expanded leaps and bounds. Um, we've, we've talked about the SPU coordination and collaboration uh, before. Uh, we've been um, very collaborative with SPU and vice versa. We're working with them to install a water quality analyzer at the boat launch uh, on the SPU where the two pipes combine, but on the SPU pipe, uh, which, is a, which is good progress. Um, we've done a number of retrofit and system modifications to our existing system. And as I mentioned before, there's a couple items that are remaining, but they're underway, and we expect to finish them on the next budget biennium. We've presented this slide before and kind of speaking to some of the items that Jason was talking about. Uh, Pre-boil water event, this graphic illustrates our sampling sites on the island where we were doing our monthly monitoring. Uh, pretty sparse. and. You can see that while we did have some representation, but perhaps not full representation of the island. So a couple of things that has happened is that with the second graphic, all of the monitoring locations that we are now doing, uh, pre-event we were only collecting data in these very few areas. Post-event, all of the dots represented on this map indicate points that we are actually collecting data on. Uh, both chlorine levels and in addition we are doing our surveillance monitoring where we actually characterize what's happening out in the distribution system using these other points as well. If I understand this, there's only that one green dot that is on the, that, is that green dot up in near to south of the boat launch, is that on that blue line? Or is there, are there any of these Sampling points on that blue line. There are not. There are not points on that blue line. Thank you. Can you explain the, the uh, differences and the different colors on the blue? Yes. <laughs> so uh, the different colors on the left-hand map, the 
red dots are the areas where we are monitoring what we call our SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition. These are monitoring sites where we are monitoring the water, uh, like Mr. Grouse said, the blue line. We are monitoring the water that comes in on that blue line constantly 24 hours a day. So that's, those are the red dots on the left graphic. The green dots are the, what we call the TCR, and I apologize for all the acronyms. Our industry loves acronyms. Uh, we call them the total coliform rule monitoring sites. Total coliform, those are the monthly samples that we take every month with the coliforms and uh, report those to Department of Health. Those are regulatory samples. The blue dot is, those are dots that we call our DPD, disinfection byproducts rule. Uh, when we talk about adding chlorine to the water, we also have to be cognizant of what is happening with that chlorine and what's it doing within the distribution system when it's all used up. So that's what we use the DPD monitoring sites for. And they are specifically located throughout the island at the further, furthest points of our distribution system. Over on the right hand side, now the colors are kind of a little bit skewed and I think that the purple ones are the ones that I want to draw your attention to. Those are the ones, the sites that we call our surveillance monitoring. When we speak of surveillance monitoring, one time a month we go to these sites and we collect data such as pH, chlorine, uh, total free iron, and R2A, HPC, uh, coliform bacteria samples. And we're using that data to uh, compile and model what is what we consider a normal condition within our distribution system. So having a good grasp and understanding of what is a normal condition. So that's what we're using those sites for. Uh, those are effectively not regulatory samples. Those are what came out of the boil water event as part of that action plan that we actually that we characterize what's happening in our distribution system. Thank you. Kind of talked about some of these things operationally. Uh, we have a target in our distribution system of uh, 0.6 or greater milligrams per liter of free chlorine throughout the distribution system. We use those points to measure that on that map that we were showing you. We do have identified three sites that have uh, presented some issues and it kind of indicated that, well, maybe we might have this happening throughout the distribution system in sites that are representative of these three sample sites. Uh, when we have these uh, events where a trigger of below 0.6 milligrams per liter is identified, uh, staff is responding by going out and actually doing bulk water turnover. Bulk water turnover is effectively hooking up to the hydrant and moving more water through a zone and moving more water through the pipes and taking the water age, if it's a higher water age, it may have a little lower chlorine level. We try to reduce that water age so that the chlorine level comes up in the pipe. Uh, again, it's representative of the water distribution system. It's based on age. And uh, we also understand that because of our monitoring, that chucking the pucks in the reservoir may not always reach all points of the distribution system. So those are some of the things that we have, we have learned. So why wouldn't it reach all points in the distribution system other than the blue, other than that blue line, which is chlorinated just off of the Seattle system? So the question, I didn't hear your first part, I apologize. Well, I, I, when you say putting the chlorine in, in, in the pucks in the reservoir won't reach the entire system. The only part of the system it doesn't reach is that little blue line that you showed us before along East Mercer. And that's presumably Seattle is, I mean that, that's the water that's coming right from the Seattle system, hasn't had a chance to dechlorinate in our reservoir, which is always part of the issue is how long it's sitting in the reservoir. So that's just coming straight in off the Seattle line when it's already been chlorinated by Seattle. Yeah, and so... The only part of the, isn't that the only part of the system that the reservoirs aren't reaching? Um, no, there are other points. So I actually have a slide on that. Okay, I'll wait for your slide. <laughs> it's a great question. The timing is perfect. Okay. So on this, this illustration, uh, you can see that the, we have the bright blue colors, the green, and I guess that's more of a mustard. <laughs> When water comes in from Seattle, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Councilman Grouse, that only that blue line is what's getting the water from Seattle. Well, effectively, the mustard color is the water that's coming out of the reservoir. 
the operational aid, depending on how our operations are running, what time of the year, the blue portion or the purple portion is, would be receiving direct Seattle water and missing the reservoir as well. So effectively, only the mustard section, when we are boosting chlorine, that's the only portion of the island that would receive the boosted chlorine. The areas illustrated in green would not be. And this is due to the makeup of the two and three different water meters and how the reservoir is actually configured. So SPU water comes in, it would effectively feed the green zone and operationally at times just the blue. Not just the, you mean the blue would only get, it, it would never have a it would not residence hold. time in the tank. It Correct. Would be straight on. It would be straight on. Straight on. Okay. And our efforts with the, uh, not only the modeling, but the surveillance has also confirmed what you're seeing here in this graphic. But, and Brian, if, if, if I understand what you said before, all three of the, the, the test sites that you're having problem results are all in the, the brown or the mustard area. Am I, am I, 3A and 15 are over in First Hill, which is clearly all in the brown. And MI-11 is down along East Mercer at around 45th or so. And that's would also be in the brown. I mean, I, that's, at least that's my take on it. That, is that correct? That, that is correct. That is correct. So our proposal with the booster chlorination station, working with our consultant, uh, developing a plan to actually ensure that this station will reach all aspects of the distribution system. So when we switch the operation with the modifications proposed in the plan, that map would effectively turn all mustard, the mustard color. So it would all be fed from one point. It wouldn't be fed from the reservoir, it would be fed from your, you're saying that the chlorine that you're that the extra chlorine you're putting in would go to the entire island, but you'd still have it coming off. The blue and the green, depending on the time of year, would still come off, would not come off the reservoir. Correct. Okay. So I'm confused um, because let's imagine I'm somebody down at the south end of the island, for instance. What you're saying is somebody almost to the very south end of the island might get water that didn't go through the tank. But the guy just south of them is going to get water that did go through the tank. And I'm, I'm questioning whether that makes any physical sense because what that suggests is that there's two different lines running. There's a line running um, separate that, that goes through the tank that gets to the perimeter, essentially, from the line that gets upstream from there. Yes. So what appears to be upstream from there at least. So it's really hard to illustrate on a on a flat map. You know, we, we're an island, so through pressure zones is how the water travels through the system. So there are actually isolations throughout the system. It it would be fair to say that it's not one hundred percent that one zone water reaching each piece of it. Through the modeling effort it gets really complicated of those colors. But effectively, this is how the pressure zones break up and where the water is sourced from. Uh, so it, water actually does flow around the perimeter rather than out and down. It can go out and down as well. Okay. It can. But it, it would be blended. Okay. But it could, it could stick to the perimeter and. Yes. All right. Thank you. And sorry. I, it's a great question. Keep on going. <laughs> So what's proposed for you in the CIP is the construction of the Pustu Chlorination Station. Um, as we've mentioned here tonight, we, um, our data collection over the last, since the Board of Water event in 2014, has nearly tripled. Uh, our knowledge of our system has increased substantially, and so uh, we have uh, documented that we have some residual, residual chlorine issues within our system when we have chlorine decay that needs to be addressed. We feel that the uh, booster chlorination station uh, installation is the most cost-effective uh, way to address those needs. Um, the water main replacement program, uh, right now we're currently replacing 0.4% per year of, of 
the water mains, uh, the standard is greater than 1%. So we're still below standard in terms of our mainline replacement. Um, however, time and available resources likely an immediate global island-wide uh, replacement program. Uh, the unidirectional flushing program that we've talked about before, uh, where we're using high velocities to scour the insides of the pipes to clean the biosolids, the biofilm out of the pipe, is uh, progress in the right direction. Uh, we've done phase one. We have phase two and phase three that we're currently working on. Uh, we envision that that'll expand system-wide, but again, that's an operational, that's an operational piece that doesn't address the immediate needs of the chlorine decay in the system. So as, as we recommended in the CIP proposal and what we're recommending tonight is that uh, we support the installation of the chlorination station to minimize our future risk of contamination. It provides our ability to uh, respond at disinfectant in the case of emergency. And we feel that it's the most cost-effective application to the immediate need of our aging distribution system. With that, that's the end of our presentation for tonight. And I'm sure you have plenty of questions for us. All right, Dan and I have kind of hogged it. Uh, let's give our council members over here a shot. Benson? I know that in the past, I mean, there's been some statements that um, this booster station or system was required by the Department of Health. And I also note that in your agenda bill, it seems to back off from that statement, that it's something that is just fully supported by the Department of Health. And so uh, I know at the last meeting, that question was specifically asked. And I thought the impression that we got was that this was sort of required by the Department of Health. It doesn't sound like it is. So I, I can talk to the first part, and I'll let Derek chime in. Um, it is the, 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 the requirement is for our call from response plan was that we have an on-the-shelf, construction-ready design of a booster chlorination station or booster injection. And that's what uh, we're currently underway working on right now. Um, however, through our um, new efforts in understanding our system and tracking our data, the, it's staff's recommendation that we install, not only do we design the on-the-shelf construction-ready um, injection system, that we actually move forward with the installation, and that's what's proposed in the 2017-2018 CIP. Um, that's, the rec that's my recollection of the requirements set forth by the Department of Health. Here, pull up the microphone there if you want to. Uh, well, um, before I get into the requirement, I, I want to stop for a moment and say um, how much I think the, the Department of Health appreciates all the work that Mercer Island has done in the last 18 to 20 months. Um, you were dealt a significant blow when uh, E. coli was identified in your system, and that blow was made doubly worse or exponentially worse when Together we lifted the health advisory associated with the first occurrence and then found E. coli again. Um, I've not experienced that before and it was uh, a lot of work by a lot of people just to get through the event. And then the amount of work that's gone into uh, follow up on that has been very impressive. That work was uh, outlined in an uh, action plan, an action response plan that uh, was part and parcel to lifting the health advisory back in late October of 2014. So to the degree, I'll answer your question directly, is the disinfection required? The action plan was required. The elements of the action plan included an assessment by uh, a third party consultant that you hired and your consulting engineer said that uh, the disinfection the, the data collected over the subsequent 18 months showed that there are some continued vulnerabilities and that the uh, ability to boost disinfection is really important. I think the requirement from the Department of Health was that you had a design ready to go. Uh, we did not mandate that you install it, but the amount of data and the kind of data that you've collected has given you a really good insight into how your system works and where you are vulnerable. And I think having that tool in the toolbox ready to use is um, very valuable. Randy, Jeff? Well, I want to go slightly different place, the water main replacement. I mean, it just strikes me that this rate is awful low. And we have some really old pipes, right? Um, so when you write about 
time and available resources. Can you educate me a little bit more about that and what could be done or proposed to the citizens or overall to accelerate our rate of replacing the oldest of the old? I can, um, for the record, Ann Tanella Howe, Assistant City Engineer. <clears throat> I think I can touch a little bit on on that part of that question. Um, some of it we may be better able to address at the at your next meeting when we bring the water system plan back. <laughs> However, that being said, um, we have a single engineer, utilities engineer, who devotes um, all of her efforts to the water utility, to the capital projects on the water utility side, um, and. In a good year, we're able to get um, maybe a mile of pipe, I think it's about a mile worth mm -hmm. of pipe, um, replaced in that given year. So knowing that our, I'm not even sure how many miles of pipe that we have, but um, knowing that we, that we are, well, how much? 113. 113. So we have 113 miles, and we're a very old system. So we, we are um, actively trying to be as proactive as we can to replace on a um, on a really aggressive basis, but where we're standing today, the the rates and the resources, the staffing resources that we have, just can't support um, much more than we're currently putting out the door. Wendy or Jeff, or you guys no, took it out over there. Um. So I'm thinking about the flushing and the chucking of pucks, and I wonder if you could clarify the vulnerabilities that we're facing. Um, if we don't do the booster pump, or if we put it off a year, or, or sorry, the chlorination pump. So tell me what it looks like if if we want to save a little money for a little while longer, even though health and safety is our number one priority. I just I want to be clear with this price tag. Is this imminent threat? Is I mean, can you give me a little bit of magnitude here? We can, Brian and I can both take this one. So I would say that uh, the data is showing that we have, as Derek said, we have vulnerabilities within our system. We are having, uh, we, it's chlorine decay within our system is an obstacle that we have to overcome. The longer we delay, the more risk is involved with that. Um, the unidirectional flushing program, uh, it takes a significant amount of staff resources and time to figure out where loops and how, where and how to flush, how to discharge the water. Uh, it's, it's not something, although we're moving to phase two and phase three, it's going to be an operational change that over time uh, will make a significant impact. But for the short term, it's, it's going to be fairly localized within the you know, specific areas that the phases are focused on. Um, anything else to add? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jason. The, um, so to kind of build a little bit on what is required to continue under the normal operation that we are doing, uh, I briefly pulled some numbers. Uh, when we realize a low number, we realize uh, less than 0.6 milligrams per uh, liter of free chlorine, we respond by flushing. We go out and flush. And I had 29, since October 15th, notifications of low chlorine, and I threw a couple quick estimates together. That's effectively one month's worth of an FTE's time uh, just for that particular flushing, not the other surveillance flushing as well. So it's a, it is a significant impact to staff time. Uh, on the other side, what do we do to boost the chlorine? Can chucking the pucks actually satisfy in term, I think, if I got the question correctly. My concern is the operator that the chucking the pucks was a great stopgap uh, through our monitoring and how the system reacted when we did that. And again, I wasn't here, but I reviewed the data. Uh, the data reflect that we were, it perhaps wasn't the best method of applying chlorine. Uh, chlorine is something that needs to be taken very, very seriously, and it needs to be put in our drinking water at a very precise metered rate. And by adding chlorine to a tank that arbitrarily can go with throughout the distribution system, not monitoring, I think we are exposing ourselves to further risk. Um, I think one of the things also just to keep in the back of your 
brains <laughs> is that um, we, you know, we have we have recently come out of a recession, so we've been very, very fortunate with our capital project costs being as low as they have been. Um, this year, we are starting to see an increase in um, contracted costs. So, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm going to predict. I'm going out on a limb. I'm going to predict that that as the economy continues to improve, those costs are going to continue to go up. Um, what that looks like next year, two years, two bienniums from now, I don't know. Um, but I don't think that we're going to be able to stay at the same um, great rates, great ca great great capital dollars that we've that we've been able to um, see in the last couple of years. So let's go in a different direction for a minute. So we are buying water from Seattle. And uh, you've, uh, Jason, talked before, and, and Derek as well, about how we're, sort of, we've had to change our ways, but we've become a bit the the, the example for others who will, will be following in uh, a, a higher rate of um, analysis of what's going on in their systems. We're not alone in that. Doesn't that suggest that Seattle's got to do? Uh, be delivering um, uh, more tuned water for other jurisdictions as well, and why would why would it make sense for us to do this and not uh, suggest perhaps more than gently that Seattle do this and deliver us water at the right level so that when it gets to us, it's what we need. So what the answer is yes. Other agencies are having to follow our example. Um, the what our data is showing though is that the water that's being delivered by SPU is at a higher residual chlorine has more residual chlorine within that water and where it's to, where the chlorine decay is happening is within our own distribution system so that the data is showing that it's our issue not Seattle Public Utilities and so that's why the booster chlorination project is in front of you tonight because it's our it's a city issue it's a city of Marshall Island issue not an SPU issue and that's uh, and I'm uh, so asking the question. That's because our system's older than other jurisdictions, so they don't get the same decay in uh, chlorine content, and so they're okay with with what they're getting at a lower level in the first place than us. Is, or is it is it something else? Yeah, it's our system that's responding differently than other jurisdictions. So Seattle, I know that has boosted their chlorine. They have changed their target chlorine uh, parameters at the treatment plant. Do, thanks to us, um, <laughs> so they have boosted it, but boosting it at a higher level. As I mentioned before, there was a slide that our 0.6 was the target. Uh, prior to the event, uh, pre-event, our target, our operational target was 0.5, and because we weren't monitoring throughout the system, we didn't know exactly how that was reacting. Now, with more data points, we're actually seeing those changes and how we're responding and how Seattle actually their applying 1.5 and we're receiving it, we're getting it our tanks at 1.5, how that's responding within our distribution system throughout, rather than just those four points that we were looking at. And is, so is the issue then that there's another jurisdiction pulling water from that same pipe that if they got, I mean, if Seattle boosted it to two, for instance, to get our level up to where we need to be after it's decayed, that would be too high a level for this other jurisdiction that has uh, less old pipes and therefore less uh, decline in the is, is that what I should understand from that or is there some why wouldn't we just ask Seattle to boost it to the level that works for us I am not sure how to answer that for Seattle maybe Derek could well I'll take a crack at it and I would kind of turn the question sideways and say well what if um, Kirkland or Bellevue needed 3.0 milligrams per liter of chlorine in their system to mitigate a section of older town, older pipe in Bellevue, and that's what you had to receive. I think... I think well, that's that, what I'm asking. Is, well, is I know, but what would you do if you had too much in your system to your customer's desire? I, I think the important part here is that um, different infrastructure... or Infrastructure is aging, and depending on what kind of pipes are in the ground at what time of... You know, what decade they were installed, um, 
they're, they're corroding. And then they're corroding because of water chemistry on the inside of the pipe, but also the chemistry that is in the ground and the soil that the pipes are buried in. And um, I think what we're seeing here is that uh, as that infrastructure ages and as capital improvement plans are less than what industry standard would suggest or the lifetime of the pipe is that you need these tools and resources in order to do these adjustments within smaller service areas. And um, you look at Mercer Island, it, it's a good example is that you have essentially a an island that you get to manage your resources on there and this is uh, an effective tool for managing um, that resource. And you do have some unique situations with a uh, large uh, linear feed of online cast iron pipe that you have that um, cities that are newer just don't have. Okay. Jeff? I Thank just you. want to make sure I understand the science. So at the fundamental level, chlorination is treating symptom water mains is treating cause. Meaning chlorination is making up for something. Do you, know, you understand what I'm asking? That basically the, we're putting this money into a something that's treating a symptom of the fact that we're getting okay water, but our system is decaying it faster than everybody else. With the chlorine well, from the outset. I, right. I think it's important yeah. to think about whereas the, the water mains themselves are actually the cause of why this thing is breaking down as fast as it is. I'm trying to make sure I understand the science so we can apply money and resources appropriately to the right thing because treating s symptoms is only of limited effectiveness over the long term. Long term. Yeah, in, in effect that's correct. Uh, chlorine decays within the distribution system for many different reasons. Uh, we add chlorine, that's our layer of protection. It's a, it's a barrier that we use. Uh, should something negatively impact water quality, we use that that free chlorine to be able to react with something that gets in it. So we do receive chlorine from chlorinated water from Seattle Public Utilities at adequate levels. Uh, as it enters our distribution system, many factors apply to it. Uh, one of those being aging pipes. Another uh, with the size of our reservoirs and tanks during different times of the year if we're not flowing enough water, the water age actually adds to that as well. So that will have an, an impact or degrade chlorine. Uh, dead end water mains, because we're an island, we're unique, we're not like a lot of the districts, not a lot. Some districts that have the nice grids that are all looped together because of our uh, geographic nature and the way our Great Island's laid out, that has an impact on the water mains as well. So adding the additional chlorine to it to reach those furthest points of the distribution system, there's multiple layers of why we would be adding it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Dan and Benson. So I've, I've got a bunch of stuff, and you're going to have to bear with me, because I'm confused. Well, let's, so, and I'll break it off at some point and let others do it. So I, I want to visualize this. So we get, a, we get a reading at station 3A, which is all the way over in First Hill, which says that it's at point two, and alarm bells go off. So right now you go out and you flush the system in order to address that. So now that you have this booster system in, tell me what you do. Do you go, do you still flush the system or do you call up someone or you say, okay, turn on the switch, put that chlorine in and we know that in you know, a week or so, by the time it gets to a reservoir, that water will eventually get to First Hill. Is, is that what we do? So that's a great question. Operationally, I, uh, I talked with staff about this. So I'm going to take you down a road of a scenario where this booster chlorination system would be utilized. We talked in detail about working with Seattle Public Utilities and putting an analyzer uh, chlorine measurement device at the boat ramp. Uh, that's underway. We're currently working on relationships with SPU to get that installed. Once that's installed, those red dots that you saw in the map of uh, where we are continuously monitoring, our operators will get a phone call and it says, Mercer Island, you have low chlorine coming onto the boat ramp. You have little or no chlorine. The operator can go on the computer and they can shut the water off to the island. Now, the idea is to reduce the risk of low chlorinated water to our residents. With that operational piece 
staff can respond and determine whether or not what the chlorine low chlorine levels are and what is causing it depending on the storage they may in activate the booster chlorination system at that time so that all the residents on the island are receiving chlorinated water if seattle had a their chlorination system go down for some reason we weren't notified we would be able to react and respond in a manner that is effectively quite a bit faster than what we have in the past so in that scenario the chlorination the booster chlorination system would come online when we need it so we would be operationally turning it on when we were received of a little or no chlorine coming from Seattle okay what about the example I just gave you so in the example that you just gave me it would be an operational decision that has to be made off of data driven decisions I just gave you the data so you, you gave me the call the data that you get a sample result that it's a monthly sample I believe you're taking it mi 3a or mi 15 which are two of your problem sites and then you get you get a call from Ann whoever gets you know, is monitoring the sampling and it's point two so what do you do I'm not going to turn the system on immediately I'm going to review the past historical data and find out what the best corrective action is it might include adding booster chlorination to the system however we also need to be cognizant of what's happening in those areas where we are getting direct feed from Seattle so perhaps that the booster chlorination may not be the answer in that scenario so the other data that comes from it to make that decision to fire up that booster station would be it now to build on your question if if I were had to see consistently low reads throughout my distribution system through my other sample points and my 3A and my historical three areas that are showing low chlorine, then that would be a time when we would make a decision of how much boosted chlorine we need to add to the system. But what's throwing me off, Brian, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm try trying to get into an argument with you on this, the agenda bill says what you've got is you've got three stations that you've in, in your presentation you've told us MI 3A, MI 15 and MI 11 are the three stations where you've gotten below 0.6 readings and all three of those happen to be served by the reservoir they're not served they're not they're in the mustard area they're not in the blue or the green area so those are stuff that's coming in when when they're served when they're not being served by the reservoir which presumably is the summertime um, they're being served directly from SPU water which you also just told us is supposed to come in at 1.5. So presumably, if you're boosting the chlorine, you're not going to be boosting above 1.5. I, I think you would have some very unhappy customers here on Mercer Island if you started boosting above 1.5. So you've got the water that the three stations that are, but and all those three stations are, are treated from the reservoir. But I, I'm I'm then left wondering if if. If those are the three stations, if, if that's where we know we have problems, and that's the only evidence we have that we've got ongoing problems, then why would we be trying to create a, a remedy which is designed to deal with parts of the system where we don't have problems, um, which is the blue and the green, because they're getting right off Seattle. Um, and why, I mean, it would seem that Chuck and Pucks, as, as Wendy referred to it, um, would be a very simple solution to deal with, you know, a bad either flushing or chucking pucks. I mean, you said that since October you've had one month of an FTE. That, by my math, is probably less than ten thousand dollars, and this is an eight hundred thousand dollar project. So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, you've got a problem, and, and I will concede to you that you've got a problem, but you've got, you've got a solution, which seems a little bit heavy for the problem but and, and I, I've got other questions but i have started to get so Benson go for it if you've got a question Brian do you want to take a shot at responding to that first or do you want to just uh, let it punt to Benson for right now you can have your choice on that <laughs> if it's okay Dan I'll punt to Benson <laughs> okay. I'll give you time to if you, if you want to uh, work it later that's why you're welcome to go ahead Benson well yeah I'm actually going to work off Dan's comments but I guess the, the question for I think for our office will be so you have one proposal for this uh, for the booster uh, uh, station and also we have a status we can do the status quo okay you guys have mentioned that that's potentially a problem that we have a risk factors and you know you're trying to address those have you guys looked at any other options 
other than the booster station or the status quo? I mean, I think the, the point is that, you know, they have $10,000. Uh, that's a pretty large number. So that, you know, causes everybody to think twice whether or not that is the right way to go. And so I'm just wondering whether or not you folks in your analysis have looked at other ways of trying to achieve some of the problems or at least address some of the problems short of the booster station. And maybe let me try to just add to that question a little bit before you answer it because what I've come to appreciate from what you've shown us so far is the system's a lot more complicated than I thought it was uh, before you started your presentation this evening. Um, and it feels like this is sort of where Dan's going, Benson's going, that this booster at the front end of the system that up, up uh, chlorinates everything is a bit of a blunt instrument for you when what you actually have is a line over here that's working its way around the island uh, or, or down the island without ever going through the reservoir and a different line that's uh, that's um, going to the reservoir and then having a long residence time. And if you just lift the level for everything, it, it feels like you, you don't have the granularity in your solution that you actually uh, would wish you had so that you could you could solve different pieces of the system in different ways. So uh, Brian and I can both sort of double up on this mm -hmm. one too. So I think it's important to note that y although it's coming out as a blunt instrument, that's not necessarily, our, as Brian said, it's not going to be our first response for a low chlorine. It's simply a tool within the toolbox that we have to use for the situation. We will, um, as, you're, as we've shown you tonight, we have a number of different data points. We have a number of different resources. And to answer Branson's question, our action plan since the boil water event has been our response. The way we've changed our operations have been our other tools that we've learned, that we've adapted to, that we are now using on a day-to-day -day basis to manage our water utility and manage the residual chlorine and clean drinking water for our community. So other options on the table, we're using them, we're implementing them. The unidirectional flushing program, uh, we're looking, we've looked, <laughs> We've looked in every crack and every corner within our utility. Uh, you have new staff members here at the table uh, that took, put our arms around this issue and have looked at it with a fresh lens. And what the data is showing is that we have vulnerabilities within our system. And this is, it's, a, it's not going to be something that we use every single day. It is simply a tool to mitigate risk. That if we do have poor water that comes to the island, or if we do have low chlorine reads across the island, we have something at our disposal to respond accordingly so that we're not stuck back in 2014 where we're responding to the boil water event, we clear ourselves, then we go back into another boil water event again. It's another tool to be used to manage our system. And to build on that, and I think this might help answer some of the questions about the low chlorine at one area. Something to bear in mind as well, I talked about it operationally, when we, with the current plan that we have in place to change the operation to boost the chlorine. Remember in the map and the graphic that I've thrown up there that this is the current operation as it stands. This map all turns mustard once we turn the valves and we change the operation into the boosting mode so that the water is coming from the one point source rather than the multiple point source. So operationally we would change to boost the chlorine so that it wasn't looking in this format. It would all be mustard brown. So we would be using one point of connection, one delivery point, reconfiguring the, si the distribution system so that it can be delivered uniformly throughout. Okay, that's important because that's different from yeah. just putting a chlorinator on the front end of a very complicated and just letting it go. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so okay. the idea is so there was an operational point, so I apologize for that. Yeah. I was going to throw a, a picture of just all one mustard color graphic up there, but I thought yeah. it might be not very useful. Jared, did you want to add something? You, you, you well, tried to get back and forth. <laughs> Let's let you just say it in your own I'm in middle school here. <laughs> <laughs> I think these guys are right on. Um, the only thing I would add is that if, when, when you're, I, I think the need of having a tool to add chlorine into your system in a precise, predictable way is critical. So the way I was interpreting your question is, are there other designs that could be considered to achieve a similar objective given the complexity of the system? And as you were saying, um, then is that what happens if it's down at the bottom of the island? What happens if, it, if it's up at the top of the island? 
Well, and one answer to the question is you could have multiple places where you're going to inject chlorine. You could do that. It would give you much more precise operational control about how you deliver that. But then you're building multiple buildings. You're duplicating your resources and you're probably spending more money. So what is happening, I think, with the proposal that is in front of you is that you do it at a place where you have the common point within your system and then you use those multiple tools, as Brian was saying, to move water through the system using the economies of scale by injecting at that one location. That's what my last note said. Okay. So the, the, um, in, in the in answer that Jason sent me this, this morning, he said that our, when the world returns to normal someday, <laughs> we're, we're hoping to get back down to 0.25 again. And, and that, I assume, is consistent with Department of Health. Um, that's consistent with your thinking as well, that, that in the, at some point we should be able to return down to 0.25. So I think there's... I really need to challenge you to think outside the box on this one because you're not normal. You have lots of <laughs> online... A lot of, people, a lot of people have told me that. Distribution system. It's all about me. I'm just getting you back for the comment you had for the fellow. Who's <laughs> no, no, but, but um, you know, when we talk about distribution systems and how do you know that chlorine is effective, um, and, and maybe I should back up even uh, further, is that there are multiple reasons why you want to disinfect the system. One is source treatment to kill organisms that you know might be in your, in your water, and that's why Seattle disinfects at the treatment plant. They are actively killing um, biological activity in their distribution system to a very specific regulatory requirement. It has to meet that requirement before it leaves the treatment plant. Another reason why you're, ma you're using chlorine is to maintain distribution system water quality. And that's where all the variables come in. The, the age of pipe, the material of pipe, the uh, hydraulics in the system, how it moves through the system. So I think when you use somebody saying the minimum residual is uh, 0.25 and that's our target, I would suggest to you that that's your target on a nice clean pipe at the farthest reaches of your system. And in order to get that residual in a nice clean pipe in the forest reaches of your system, what do you have to have along no, I, the pipeline I, all the way back I, to the source? And I understand that. I, I think so, the, what, I, what I was saying is that at some day that, you know, when MI3A comes in at 0.25, people won't get all upset because that's an acceptable level that, from a health standpoint. You know, someday, it, you know, in, in, a, in a perfect world, Department of Health and, and, and federal authorities will agree that you can use UV to disinfect and not just chlorine. I mean, you know, which is a, it's because a lot of systems around the world use UV, and it's only because we're determined to have to measure residual chlorine that we don't let UV do, which is probably a heck of a lot more effective than chlorine anyway. It's another discussion. Uh, another discussion. <laughs> I, I would say, um, well, if you're Seattle's uh, cedar treatment plant, which you get water from, treats the water with UV. It's one of the three disinfectants that are being used. Mm -hmm. So. Let's, let's let Wendy have a yeah. shot here and uh, come back. So, um, so we have the design. Jason, do you see construction beginning in the first place? Would this be online by the end? Oh, sorry. You said we'll be done, done, done with all of this by the end of 2018. So this would be 2017. We do more evaluation. We keep working with our friends at Department of Health and monitor the chlorine levels and <laughs> maybe put this water boil advisory behind us once and for all? I would love to put the boil water advisory behind <laughs> us. Because <laughs> we'll have a uh, system except for replacing pipes, right? So, so uh, currently, so <coughs> today we've done feasibility. So as Bruce has mentioned, our system is very complex. Uh, it's not just one or two pipes that we're dealing with. It's, it's a complex system. And so we've done feasibility. That's where we're today. That's where the, that's where the number for the CIP development is, is from. Um, we expect that that number could be modified. There's some things that are going on right now. I've mentioned their conversations with, uh, with SPU. Um, we're trying to work with SPU to try and um, piggyback off of their utilities and uh, their new box to save a cost on installation uh, for this. So we expect that that number will be modified by the time it comes back to the council in the October-November budget meetings. Um, the 
but because of that, the design will, the design will continue because we have to move forward with the design this year. It'll carry into the first part of next year. So that's why you see a phase construction between the 17 and 18 is because by the time we finish design, we'll go into the first part of construction 17 and it'll wrap up at 18. So by the end of 2018, we should be done with this response. Can we also look at this um, main replacement schedule and rate, or is that sort of a whole separate issue? And I think if we're going to do this, we need to yeah. also look it's, at the it's part of our It's part of our CIP process, and I don't, I'm going to look to Ann if she knows what, how many miles were proposed in the next biennium, but um, it's definitely part of the rate conversation. It's part of our CIP, uh, and then we can, we can definitely talk about it. Yeah, we can we can be prepared to bring that that level of information on the CIP back on August first when we bring the water system plan mm -hmm. to you. That would be a really good conversation to have. Um, but again, the it, it's safe to it's safe for me to say that we're probably going to need to look at if if main replacement is. Um, a high priority for the council. It's safe for me to say that we're going to need to um, look at how we ramp up that re that rate of replacement over the next many years. Well, we will have to pay for it somehow. Yes. <laughs> how much per mile? About how much per mile? About the average cost per mile? Yes. Uh, Francie's jumping it, up in the back row. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does vary, but I yeah, I don't know that I have a number. For the record, Francie Lake, Deputy Finance Director, and I, I don't have a per mile number for you, but what I can tell you is that the 0.4 percent that we're replacing right now, we're spending one to three million dollars a year. So if you were to double that, we would go to four to six million a year, and rates would increase quite a bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Seeing none. I uh, so you're looking for direction from us, which I assume at this point is carry on or redirect in some fashion. Correct. Um, okay. Council, um, I'll just try. Um, I had a bunch of questions coming in. I feel like they've been answered. My inclination at this point is to say carry on. Uh, anyone wish to enter into a discussion about a different direction they think we ought to take? Well, I, I may end up getting there, but I'm, I'll just, I'm concerned that the basis for this decision is is that there, there are two rationales given for this originally, or three rationales. One was that the Department of Health is requiring this, and that that's not the case. That that there is the well, Derek already spoke to that. Um, the second was that we got parts of our distribution system that are not serviced by the reservoir. Um, but then we know that that part of the system is getting water directly from SPU, which is at coming in at 1.5, so there shouldn't be a boosting issue on that. And then, in fact, the, the, then we've got the three stations which are showing problematic results of below 0.6. All those are getting serviced off the reservoir, um, according to the map that Brian gave us. And but because they're at the very, at, at where they are in our system, in effect, it would take probably about, you know, if, if, if you got a bad reading today, by the time you put in the, you spike the chlorine at this injection system, the way our system is designed, as I understand it, it would be a matter of days and maybe more than a week before that water actually made it to those ends of the system, because it goes into the reservoir and then it's, it's, at parts of our system which are at ends of distribution lines like First Hill. Um, and then, so what I, I'm just guessing, but my guess is Brian's going to end up flushing that part of the system anyway, just because he needs to do an immediate fix of a problem rather than wait for a week for the, for the chlorine levels to go up. So I'm, I'm just concerned that, I, I understand, I understand why staff 
yeah, that this is a it's a tool. It's a nice tool to have, um, but I I'm a little bit concerned that, that there's not a case that's been made for the problem that this will solve, um, because the the base. I mean, the, the the gist of the agenda bill is we've got distribution system. We've got we've got parts of the distribution system which aren't serviced by the reservoir, and but and so that's not solved by this because that's coming in directly from SPU. And we've got three stations which are so f located in our distribution system where this isn't going to provide the immediate solution. And then, to, I'm I'm a little bit I, I'm, I'm thinking that we're spending eight hundred thousand dollars when you know I, I that it's probably not the best use of the eight hundred thousand dollars. And that I, let me try and frame your question a little differently and a lot shorter. Uh, you <laughs> talked about putting in this system, but you also talked about an operational change that runs all the water through the reservoir rather than having it go to different parts of the system first. Why would you not just make the operational change and continue to put pucks at the reservoir? Go ahead. So the operational change, again, if we receive a level that coming from SPU there is not adequate chlorine, we will be able to respond to that. Operationally, so there's a couple different scenarios in your question that can happen operationally. One, SPU's chlorine level could be low or non-existent. So at that point, the booster chlorination station, we would change the operation to boost chlorine or actually put chlorine in the system. And then secondly, uh, by changing the operation to just go to that one single point of the where all the SPU water comes into one point, we can change that operation, but we know that the decay in our system is greater than what SPU is giving us at certain times of the year, and we know that because of our surveillance monitoring. So if we switch it to what SPU is giving us, we know that that may not be qu quite adequate, as in uh, Dan's comment that just 3A is low, we may need to switch that and run it through the entire system for a period of time to boost that up. Did that answer that? I, I, you left me confused, to be quite honest. Sorry, I, why can't we but, run water from the... Yeah, if you, so the, if you can turn everything into mustard. If I can turn everything into mustard. Well, you, you've said you, you can't operationally make everything flow through the tank. So, right. so the tank becomes then upstream of everything in the system. I mean, am I right that that was what you were saying you, yes. you could operationally do? And if you can do that, then it seems to me that it doesn't matter if you put the chlorine in when it comes on island or you put the chlorine in at the tank. Both are upstream of any customers. And our data shows that currently SPU is not providing enough chlorine at certain times of the year to reach the furthest end of the distribution system. Right. Does that help? Right. And, so and that's that's so my question still becomes boosted at a booster thing in the in the um, uh, boat launch thank you or boosted in the tank it, from a customer standpoint it's all the same because either way you've boosted it correct before it got to them right before it went to the furthest point so before it went to any point in a nutshell if in that scenario turning everything to mustard I like using that turning the whole map to mustard that without the chlorination system the chlorine levels fall off, degrade, it decays within our distribution system at a higher rate where we would need to boost the chlorine level to reach those furthest points. Derek, we're going to you because I know you have some <laughs> notes again. So what do you got? What do you think? Well, I, I think going back to we're throwing pucks in the storage tank effective at raising the chlorine residual in a predictable, uh, measurable, and controllable way. And I think the data would show that no. In, in bulk it is, but what you have constantly happening is the tank is filling, the tank is emptying, you've got these little pucks of high chlorine concentration thrown on the bottom of the reservoir, and when your booster pump turns on to shoot water up to the hill, that's going to, depending on where the intake is on the pump station from the tank, is going to suck either heavily chlorinated water or not chlorinated water. By putting this as a flow proportional paste um, chemical injection system that's designed to do that, you're going to have far more control on this situation. So, okay, uh, <laughs> got that. Uh, okay, so I'm back to, yeah, I understand. Um, 
did that help you or you um, well I, I, I understand what you're saying I mean and that's if yeah, because that, if you recall, two years ago when we were talking about that, we were talking about putting mix masters inside the tanks mm -hmm. as a way to deal with the the issue you just addressed. And I don't know what happened to the mix masters the idea that I, mean, you had, I think, Ann, you had even gone so far as to locate them in, in California at the time to, to, to see if they were available because we thought we might have to get them in a rush. Yeah, and Derek might have to help me with jogging my memory, but I, th I, I think what we determined is that that investing in a in a mixing system was probably not the best use of our resources at the time because we didn't need we didn't really need them on an ongoing basis. Um, my recollection, so my rec and my recollection of the, of the chucking of the pucks because it went on for as long as it did. Um, it's really it wasn't really a predictable use of the chemical in the tanks that we have and and even with even with mixers in our tanks we may not have been able to come up with a predictable and a reliable chlorinated system in those tanks um, where was I going to go with this? I, uh, you know, I I, underst I, I I think I understand some of the reluctance when, <clears throat> at least today, we have a, a tar a, a, an, air, an area that we can point to and say this is the area of the island that we're having the problems and and this boosted system may or may not help that. It probably will help that, and so then that might make that part of our island system. Um, better and no longer need to be boosted. But as my as soon, my my fear is that as soon as we correct First Hill, um, we're going to start to see similar pl problems in other parts of the island, and we can chase this dog ar around the island for as many years as we want to. Um, but again, I don't. Uh, I'm sitting from a place where it doesn't feel like that's a great use of the limited resources. Um, that we have, and those limited resources are are the staff resources that have to either get up on top of the tank to chuck the pucks or to to chase the problem around the island to to um, inject chlorine at a specific location and then you know move off to a new location. Um, but does it is it any less expensive to put the chlorine injection system up at the reservoir rather than? And just be the entry point to the reservoir, then putting it down at the boat launch. So, I mean, because it shouldn't be. If you if you're going mustard, the whole the whole system going mustard, everything's being served off the reservoir anyway, so as, as Bruce was saying. So where you inject, as long as you inject it before the tanks, it should make no difference whatsoever. You, I can understand Der Derek's point that injecting it into the, that taking a bottle of Clorox and throwing it in the tank is probably not the best way to to mix things. But if you as long as you inject it in the pipe just before the, the reservoir, you get the exact same result. And so that is exactly the plan. Yep. So at this point, at our conceptual design, that we will utilize portions of the reservoir site to house the station and use the property that we currently have to put the station there and then pipe to that point to turn the whole island mustard. <laughs> Do you, do you have an issue there storing chlorine? Is it chlorine gas, or what are you, what are you using for chlorine? Uh, a good question. We At this point, we've gone through uh, with our consultant sourcing out the different types of methods and applications. And at this point, we are doing further development on and research on the best application of either on-site hypochlorite generation or perhaps a sodium hypochlorite high-test tablet. Uh, super saturator. So you're going to chuck a puck into the pipe instead of chuck a puck into the tank. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Three times real fast. Uh, I think council members uh, carry on or um, redirect. I'm, I know Dan may be on the fence, maybe not, but I'm looking down here to see where others are. I'm, I'm in support of allowing them to proceed. I, I guess you've answered a number of my questions that I had, but you know, I, I hearken back to this idea that I, I think it's great to have this additional tool, and you guys have described the benefits of this tool. I just 
just really wonder how often we're going to use this eight hundred ten thousand dollar. I mean, when we need it, it'll be great. But I'm just, you know, you'll never know. I mean, so it's. I suppose it's good to have an uh, as insurance. But I, I just really wonder, you know, again, you know, how many times we're going to uh, need it. I mean, because as as you mentioned, Brian. When a problem arises, you're not going to be fl flicking the switch off uh, right away. You're going to be looking at it and see if there's other ways to deal with the problem. So, I guess that's my only hesitation. But you know, at this point, uh, I'm certainly willing to have you guys continue to look in, look at uh, this uh, installation of this station. So, Wendy, Jeff, um, utilities are expensive, and everybody takes them for granted until something goes wrong. So, I applaud you for the response and doing all this great work to get to here. And as much as I don't want to spend eight hundred ten thousand dollars on insurance policy, it's much better than having to deal with the second boil advisor boil water advisory two or three years later. So thank you for the solution. Thank you for working with our consultants, SPU, DOH, city staff. I mean, it's been an army responding to this. And if this is the final step, let's just, let's move on. Sure. Yeah, I'm kind of in the Benson Wendy lines where this feels difficult because it's such an expensive power tool to just have as an additional tool, expensive insurance. Um, I'll look forward two weeks as we learn about the water system because <laughs> it still feels to me like we are addressing something that is the cause, the symptom, where the, wa the age of our water system is really the, a very important thing to focus on. And But at the same time, water is probably one of our number one issues that we have to do, and we have to do everything we can on those big ones. So uh, keep going. Um, and I'm on carry on as well. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll go for carry on, but I have one last question. So we're spending 810000 on this. What what assurances have you got from SPU they're not going to flush a line again and and do what they did last time? So we have, um, they've created an SOP. We have, um, they've, they've, anytime they change their operational controls, they have to notify our utilities operator prior to doing that. So we have that from them. So we get prior, we get prior notification from SPU before they change the valves. So that's when you turn on the system to insulate us from when they flush the lines on us? Well, and we have their analyzer downstream before they do that, right? So, and, and that, I assume, is a fairly instantaneous response sort of analyzer. It's not mm -hmm. sample and take it away in 10 right. days. Yeah. We have learned a lot of things that particularly where those red dots were on that map where we're continuously monitoring. So one of the upgrades, working with Seattle Public Utilities, monitoring that water as soon as it comes across uh, the East Channel, so we are made aware of it long before it gets to the reservoir site. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And out of that, it's a direct phone call to SPU if there's bad water coming across the island as well, too. So, All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, particularly to our... DOH folks, Derek, and is it Brietta? Yeah, thank you. You got to sit quietly and uh, avoid the, the table, but thank you for being here. So, um, and uh, staff members, Brian and, and Jason, thank you. Okay, uh, council members, on to the next bill. All right, so uh, we go now to agenda bill 5202, I-90 loss of mobility negotiations update. And Kirsten, I think you're going to um, run us through this, right? Thank you. All right, good evening, Council. Uh, for the record, Kirsten Taylor, your Assistant City Manager. And I want to give you a brief status update um, on the I-90 loss of mobility negotiations tonight. We, we have not given the, you know, a, a, an update like this for several months, and I think that we've been receiving increased questions. So we wanted to start with this um, update, and then I'll also talk about uh, potential additional c communications that we'll be looking for. So some background. Um, as you will recall, we had significant public outreach last fall. Um, there were a series of meetings with the Mercer Island public to identify and discuss mobility issues of concern to the community. and those 
those identified mobility issues for both um, we identified mobility issues for both the construction period of light rail and then after light rail is in effect. We determined that our Mercer Island goals um, are, here's a, a, few, a few of our major goals, are to um, retain access to the new R8A HLV lanes. That's definitely a community goal. Uh, we want to have limited impacts on town center mobility throughout um, construction and after light rail is in place. We want convenient commuter parking for Mercer Island residents. And we also want better last mile connections to the light rail so that people have um, alternatives to driving to light rail. And we want to make sure that there's no greater commuter bus impact than we have today, than the community has already um, adjusted to. So some of our current efforts that have been um, taking place over the last uh, six months um, is that our, our council members um, have been engaging key representatives at local, regional, state, and national levels um, so that they understand and respect our historic agreements um, regarding I-90 and mobility. Um, also, the mayor has been to uh, a meeting in Washington, D.C. to ensure that the city's case is fully understood by all necessary federal agencies and our state's delegation um, in Washington, D.C. So those are two very important current efforts. Uh, we've noticed with communications that there have been an increase in public questions um, because it has been uh, a number of months since we have um, had updates to the community. You know, the questions, what's going on? Um, and so we would like to increase the communications going out to the community. We know we need to give accurate, clear information about our past documents and agreements. And we also need to have consistent and timely outreach efforts to all residents about any um, ongoing um, efforts that we're making. And we have limited communications availability with our half-time communications manager. Uh, we feel that this is a bigger effort and we, we really could uh, benefit from having some additional communications dollars um, devoted to communicating with the community over something that you know we understand is, is a top priority to this community. So one of the things that I would like to ask tonight is that we um, we're asking for a thumbs up on spending ten thousand uh, dollars to increase our communications out to the public. Um, we have interviewed some um, communications firms and would like to utilize one of those to make sure that our communications are um, are clear, easily accessible, um, pushed out to the community, so that we're making sure that the whole community has access to this information. So that's my my brief update. Uh, maybe, Kristen, you could put that in the context of uh, other folks we're using as resources to work through this um, this whole negotiation that we're going through sure. with Sound Transit and Washington and folks, because it's yeah. it's obviously not just a communications effort. It's uh, much yes. more than that that we're engaged in. So the council has funded. Um, monies for uh, Washington to advocates um, to assist us in, in our efforts and outreach and um, with our delegations and, and all of the local, regional, state, national um, agencies. We also have legal resources that we've been using those dollars for and engineering resources so that we can make sure that we are getting our own analysis of any of the engineering information we're getting from Sound Transit. That's one of the things we ran into in the past was that when we needed an analysis done, Sound Transit did the analysis and of course the results weren't necessarily the results we yes. would have uh, would have mm -hmm. sought or the, mm -hmm. the question wasn't framed quite the way we would frame it. And so important to have our, our team in, in mm -hmm. place, I think, to, to get through all of this. Yes. Uh, council member questions. So
So I'm struggling with the timing of this while we're still trying to figure things out. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we need to figure out how to spend this money tonight or even to retain mm -hmm. somebody until we know. So I'm thinking about timing and deliverables mm -hmm. before we really mm -hmm. know what the messages are. One of the things that we want to make sure that we that we have readily available is on our website um, the documents and information so that people can understand our historic documents. Um, and that's going to take some you know, significant additional effort to make sure that it's it's available and accessible and understandable by the general public. Um, so we'd like to, and that, no matter what results of negotiations, that's going to be an important essential product. So that's something we'd like to get started on now. And also looking at what some of the community questions are. We understand that there's an increase of questions on next door. Um, and other questions coming into council members or into staff. So we'd like to take those questions and develop some um, Q&A or, or FAQs so that, that those questions aren't just answered to a couple individuals but are available across the whole community. Uh, and I think the sense is that better uh, to begin to plan now than to wait until we're at the moment of saying, okay, we've got to do a whole bunch of communicating with this. How are we going to do it? So the thought is, I think, to be mm -hmm. a bit proactive. Um, so this is about planning to communicate as much as it is about communicating. A, a combination I, of those things. Yeah. And we've, we've been... We've been caught in the past with having something moving quickly with, with other city initiatives. And we, we don't want to be behind in getting information to the community. We'd really like to be out in front so that um, you know people aren't saying, well, when are you going to get us this information? When are you going to get us this information? And that we can point to it, have it ready to go. Because the community really cares about this topic, and um, the, the interest is growing. Jeff, and then Benson. Yeah, so, uh, Kristen, this person that you would theoretically hire would work for you, would report yes. directly to you? Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm very, you know, I'm very pro-communications. I'm very pro-being proactive mm -hmm. about thinking about it. And I would just say that I hope the approach here is not one of sort of a one-off look mm -hmm. at this particular issue, but I know that if you think about town center, if you think yeah. about this, mm -hmm. what we've got on residential, what we've got coming down with potential levy yes. lid lifts, we have mm -hmm. many opportunities to improve how we get input from our community, how we communicate back to our community. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that whatever you do when we read the proposal, that it addresses not specifically this is the transit communication plan, but this is the how we do better at communicating yes. with the public plan. Mm -hmm. And, and I so think it provides a template for mm -hmm. every situation that we see coming down in the next 12 months. Yes. Benson? I certainly agree with uh, what uh, Councilmember Sanderson has said. And I guess I I as far as um, the, the initial $10,000 or whatever amount, um, when can we expect, I mean, I guess it sounds like the scope of work obviously has to be still, is still being developed. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess if the one plan is to uh, develop some sort of strategy or some sort of way of communicating or pushing out the message, as you mentioned, when do we get to see that again? What, what's your time frame for when the council can see uh, this plan that's being developed? We are, what we want to, our next step is to, to determine what um, our communications manager, Ross Freeman, can do and how to best complement what he can do and what other resources we need. Um, so we anticipate having that developed in the next few days. Um, and then depending on what council would like, we can, we can come back to you with products or we can come back to you with a plan. Uh, would like to get working on the products uh, immediately, but if you prefer, we could come back, you know, with with the plan of action as a first step. Um, 
Let's, well, let's keep going with questions and we'll, you know, sort of come back to what Kirsten's offering as a couple of options here after we get through that. Jeff? I'll make it a question. Um, so there's a, an upcoming, like in Jeopardy, yes. um, the, uh, there's, there's an upcoming scope of work for the residential project. Yes. Are you explicitly working through, and that will require a communications and input strategy, are you explicitly thinking about the ties between that, you know, so I assume they're going to come to us with a scope mm -hmm. of work there with a potential communications person. So are you, this is a form of a question, are you thinking through? You know, we haven't tied those two those work project products together, but we certainly can um, explore that and, and just see what, what we can learn from one to use with the other, the other effort. Okay. Wendy? So, can you just remind me what else Ross is working on? I know he's part-time sustainability and part-time communications, and I know this is special, and I know our residents are keenly uh, tuned into mm -hmm. this, and there are mm -hmm. lots of communication channels, and I know we want to get in front of the messaging. And, and Ross and our interim city manager and you seem like very capable people mm -hmm. to help us with that as well as including some of the resources we've already put on this project. Um, so I guess... Tell me a little bit about what our staff would be doing. Are we going to just hand this off with no, the we, guidelines? No, we, we intend to work very closely. Um, I, I always want to learn from a process that we go through, and I definitely want to take whatever we develop or um, a style of communication or a plan of communication and then apply that across any other efforts that we are making as a city. Um, and right now, Ross is going to meet tomorrow with the, our potential consultant to um, work through some of those details to see what he can do, what he has capacity to do. We, we stretch him really thin. Um, he has a lot of capabilities, uh, but we ask him to do a lot of things. And we are looking at this as, as a big push to make sure that we are getting information readily available that's re you know easily understood um, just excellent communications ready for the for the public so I don't want to say we don't have some skills and, and abilities in-house we we absolutely just don't have the time to make sure that we're doing this really right and I think the community wants us to do this this one really right okay and you have uh, so, the question was asked, or Kirsten offered, do, or maybe Benson, you, you sort of framed it up, what, what comes next? Uh, do you want to offer what you'd like to see come next? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, Kirsten, you mentioned products versus the plan, or yes. action plan, I guess. So, again, remind me, when you say products, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking of... Um, getting a prototype for a page, uh, having uh, Q&As or FAQs developed, um, having making sure that we've got um, just all of the introductory pieces to some of our historical documents. I mean, those are just a few of the products that we want to, to get moving. We also do want to have a plan in place of, of how we're presenting information and so that when throughout negotiations we have results to present to the community that we are ready to go that we aren't caught short trying to catch up and go oh how do we now communicate to our community around this so we definitely want to have those plans in place as well um, just because we know that the community is going to want to know as soon as possible when we do you have a sense of how long it will take you to develop the products uh, you know I guess you know obviously everybody is looking at the clock and they, you know, looking yeah. at mid 2017 as the time when the center rode away. You know. We want to just, we want to, to move on this and get products done in the next month or so. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. And, and then presumably you can still be working on the plan when yes. you're doing the product. At the same so time. it's yes. not going to be, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think it is important to get the products out. I mean, obviously there is some information that be, be useful to have the community have the same basis of understanding um, and so so I'm certainly in favor of that but I certainly given the time frame it's July and you know perhaps less than a year and you know we 
you know, I know that negotiations are going on. Um, you know, things are still in a state of flux. So, you know, I, I guess there is a sense of urgency. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to wait too long to get the action plan back to the council for its review. So, so what, you'd, what you'd like to see is this come back to the council then? I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest in just a little while, spoiler alert, that we do not have our second August meeting. Uh, which everybody's already expecting, but that means that we probably would want to make this decision at our first August meeting, which is just a couple weeks, um, rather than wait all the way to the beginning of September. So I think, Kristen, are, are you comfortable suggesting that we bring back something with a little bit more specificity to the first August meeting then? We can certainly do that. Okay. I'd like to just get going. I would yeah. just, you know, and start developing things now, but if the council um, is more comfortable, seeing this revisited yeah Pam I, I just want to ask a question make sure I'm very very clear because we what I heard was a scope versus a plan the plan yeah. would be an outcome the scope would be an in input so mm -hmm. I what we're bring, bringing back in on August 1st is the products or at least a plan or do you are you talking because this if it's the scope then we can't get started Thank you. That clarification. Thank so we may not be able to have a plan in, we would have to have that prepared for an agenda bill by next week. So that's not realistic. But we could certainly come back in September, the first meeting in September, with the, the plan and work products and um, present that to council. Wendy? I'm just going to channel Dave here for a minute and just say I'd love to build some in house capacity for these communications issues. And Mary and Jeff, it, we have a lot of issues that a lot of people care about and want to mm -hmm. hear about and in this digital age we can't wait so I get that mm -hmm. so I'm I'm supportive of figuring out how to get this communication issue going for this I-90 mobility but I really really want to make sure we don't keep hiring consultant after consultant after consultant mm -hmm. we did this for the town center we are gonna have to look at this for mm -hmm. single-family residential budget issues capital budgets I mean we need to sort of build this strength in-house we have good people Let's clear some of the decks and prioritize so we can make sure this gets done and stays in house. Okay. I hear a suggestion that we should have two of Ross. Yeah. At least one. Oh, one. Yeah. One. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I just want to second Wendy's motion that, I mean, communications is underdone here. Mm -hmm. And we need to really think about our in house capacity in mm -hmm. FTE terms for, for doing a great job of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should be moving forward on this, but I would say in my little two-second wine rant is that I hope we've done, I don't think we've done the right post-mortem on the town center visioning process because okay. we hired a consultant there. We spent a lot of money on communications. Do we have a good sense, mm -hmm. I'm doing this as a statement instead of a question, since it's statement yeah. time, of analyzing, you know, how effectively we communicated uh, with the public in that mm -hmm. process to feed into this one. Yes. And that's critical to me that yes. we've done that or do that post-mortem on the whole process, but mm -hmm. specifically the communication where we spent communications right. money and I want to make sure that anything we learn there gets applied here. Yes. And then so forth and so forth. I agree. You had Pam furiously taking notes while you were saying that. So <laughs> I think that the, the, point, <laughs> the, the point came across. Let me pile on on that a little bit. I, I don't Know how many of you have been watching on next door the city getting trashed for Calkins Landing and Calkins Point and the series of posts? Some, somewhat, somewhat confused posts. Because yeah, the, but, the name but it, it, it is, in my, without commenting on, on the posts themselves, it's unfortunate the city doesn't have the capability to respond to those posts. I mean, it, it's just because I, I think there's probably a very good response and it's, and, and I mean, interestingly, that there's a couple of citizens who have have put in some good responses, but it should be the city spa explaining what was done there, and and because those are beautiful projects, and and instead the 99% of the islanders who probably have not even gone down there, the only thing they're hearing about it is is being trashed by by a few people who are against it, and and that's unfortunate. I mean, but the city needs to be able to get out front on this stuff, and 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 Ross needs to be able to get out front on this stuff now already, because we just we're getting beaten up for absolutely no reason whatsoever without any effort to to explain what we're doing as a city. And we're in an environment where Ross can't even see. I mean, mm -hmm. well, he, he can see he, them. He can't see no. them. 
He can't see them. Not unless he... Unless he initiates them, he yes. can't see them. Mm -hmm. We can fix that. Yeah. We can copy and paste. We can fix that. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, we have another person in the city who's, who is getting all the posts. We know that. So it, it's doable. It's definitely doable. All right. Kristen, I think you've got what you need at this point. So I'm. what I heard is that we are going to come back with a plan and products um, at the beginning of September. Okay. Council? Okay. okay. All right. Um, we're going to move on to other business. Council member absences. We have two. Two of our council members apparently are in Florida enjoying the, the warmth there uh, of, of the Orlando summer. The Microsoft absence. Yes, Microsoft absences. Is there a motion to excuse Debbie and uh, Dave? I move that we Give it a try. We'll find Debbie out. and Dave. <laughs> Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, upcoming absences, new upcoming absences of which we should be aware. Yourself. And by the way, that's on the planning schedule. If you have yeah. read your planning schedule, you would have seen that I announced that quite some time ago. Right. So, I'm, I'm there you go. Yeah, I'm shown as a question mark on August first. That's because we're flying. I mean, I'm going to. Two, I like Tuesdays as our day. I've given that input. Um, I'm flying back uh, from something on August first. Plane arrives like at six thirty. I can come straight here, so I'm late. But so I'm gonna. Council member lateness. Tardy. Council member tardiness. Okay. So I will get here as soon as I can that day. But I will be late. All right. And I will be gone. So I'll expect you to cover for me when you get here. Um, planning schedule. Pam, do you have any um, uh, yes. insights to offer here? Well, I, I was going to talk about the residential development code revision, but that I was... I stole the thunder. Sorry yes, about you did. That. So I don't need to mention that. That's coming back. Um, and I'm um, hopeful that there will be uh, a decision tonight telling us what you're going to do on the 15th. I want to point out the CenturyLink cable franchise, and I think you're, um, we're going to be trying to get some advance information to you uh, before that meeting. And I believe, um, Allie, if I got this right, that the residential development standards on September 19th, uh, that Scott pulled those. Am I right about that? Or do you know? Yeah. He was reviewing the planning schedule this morning and saw that on there as a study session and doesn't know how it actually got onto the planning schedule as a study session on that date. So, okay. that's, so he removed it from there. I think his plan is to... Uh, we, uh, after the planning commission meeting tomorrow night, bring back a timeline for approval for okay. and review of the standards. So that is um, something to cross off your calendar. That's it. Okay. So, uh, two, one comment, one observation. October third is the first day of Rosh Hashanah, um, which we have traditionally not had council meetings on the high holidays. Um, so it just, that's, it would, I believe you could put it on the 4th though because actually that's after the end of Rosh Hashanah if you wanted to go to the, the, the 4th. I believe the, then that's the night of the 2nd and the 3rd and the night of the, yeah. So ideally in, out of tradition we would move that to October 4th if that's possible. And Jeff, would that suit you? Am I well, about both because it's a Tuesday. Am I about to be outed for my non-observation? <laughs> observation. No, 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 yeah, he's he's I, offering to move it to a Tuesday. I think move, I love Tuesdays as our day, and I thought this, you know, as we view whether we move permanently to Tuesdays. But I'm, I, I would move it to Tuesday out of respect okay. for the holiday. Yeah, so that's one thing. Um, if that works on people's schedule. So, so uh, no surprise here, not Jewish, but when you say Rosh Hashanah, October 3rd is the first day of the holiday, well, because one le logically it then believes that the next day would be the second day of the holiday, ends, and therefore that doesn't work. But so just it, help me understand. It ends at sundown, and basically okay. people who observe um, go to temple, um, would go to temple on the 3rd and the 4th in the morning, and that would pretty much be done by the middle of the day on the 4th. 
Okay. So, so, so doing it the evening, uh, having a council meeting on the evening of the fourth, that, that, that would be does fine. not conflict with yeah, the holiday. The, the, we, the wrath of the gods will not come down upon us. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay, um, so that's one thing. Second thing, um, and, and I'm not expecting you to know the answer to this, Pam, but one of the things that we hopefully are going to schedule on this is the Michael lease. And as my understanding is that it's sitting, that they've now submitted everything to DSG. The, 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 what we this is predates you, and, and that's well. Yeah, I do have an update on that if you want it, though. Yeah, well, I'm just curious, at, at some point, are, are we going to know when it's going to come back to the council, is, is really my question? Yes, I asked Scott that, and he, the, the um, CEPA review is going on now, they're reviewing it now, and um, the amendment uh, that is required is going to go back through the Planning Commission and is expected to come back to the council. He just said the fall, so I don't know if that's September or October or even November, but it's supposed to come back in the fall. What I don't know is um, how the short plat process dovetails with that, well, that, that or if there is any there's no, there's no short plat process. What, what I think he's referring to is a zoning, is a P, P zone issue, but can Carrie correct me if I'm wrong, if, if I recall what we passed before is that once the SEPA review is completed, then it, the lease itself is supposed to come back to the council. That the, the lease action on the lease does not depend upon the P zone being completed. Scott's actually the better person to talk about the sequencing, but it's my understanding that they received um, a letter stating that more materials needed to be submitted as part of the SEPA review, and there actually is a subdivision component required under RCW 58.17, so their team is looking at that as well. Um, regarding the code text amendment, um, that as um, our interim city manager um, mentioned is needing to go to the planning commission most likely, but I, again, I don't know about exact sequencing. I'll need to check with Scott and we can give the council an update about that. And, and, and all I was saying, if, if, if my recollection is correct, that there were a bunch of things, we all know there's a, several hoops they still need to run, jump through but the sequencing that I recall the council passed and when we did this before was to say that once SEPA was done, then the lease would come back. And, and that was the only, con the only condition proceeding to bringing the lease back was SEPA. Now, obviously, SEPA has to be finished, but I don't think anything else was a condition proceeding. It will come back to council. Again, I just can't give more specifics about timing. Uh, SEPA review is still underway. I understand that. I'm, sorry. I'm just saying that at some point once, but you answered one question that they've, they've been asked to provide more information, so the SEPA review is continuing. But at some point, we just need to make sure that, I mean, you make your own determination of what we passed before, but I, I believe that it says that once SEPA is done, it's supposed to come back to us. Understood. It will be coming back. Again, I just can't tell you exactly when. Okay. Other? Ready? So regarding that and this new Protect Our Parks initiative, will you also provide information about how that initiative, if they get signatures, will impact our review of the lease or legality? I don't know how those two are in conflict or concert with each other. That's not something I can speak to tonight. Um, and the 90-day clock has started with regard to um, Parks Initiative 2.0, if you will. Um, so we'll see, and there's definitely going to be more to follow about that. As more information becomes known, again, I just can't speak to that. Um, the interplay between the two. I understand. You're welcome. Anything else planning schedule-wise? I, so I've got two things. Uh, Mayor, the first, Mayor thing Bassett, did we make the decision to move the meeting in October? Yeah, you're just you're you're cutting in on. Well, me. there was a lot of conversation right and I'm no going decision. Going there right now. So with that, I need a motion to cancel or to uh, do away with our second August meeting, if that is the will of the council. I believe. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Very well. You have the second meeting of August off. And then the other bit of, um, I, I guess maybe it would be under reports, but I'll put it here, is uh, everyone should be aware that National Night Out is coming on August 2nd. 
Uh, and for our new council members, this is an opportunity to get out and schmooze with the public. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us to uh, have our, the public interact with our public safety officers and uh, other staff. And in this day and age of some really horrible things happening out there um, in other parts of the country, it's a particularly nice moment for us to build strong ties between our public and our public safety folks. And Chief, if you want to add anything to that, you certainly may. Uh, for the record, Ed Holmes, your police chief. The only thing I would add is that at the Sculpture Garden, we're going to have a, a gathering there from 5 to 8 that night. And yes, uh, in honor of Councilmember Sanderson, we will have hot dogs. And uh, there's even a, a possibility Nancy Stewart will be there here for some uh, music that she'll perform, uh, sponsored by the Mercer Island Library. So um, we may also go visit specific neighborhoods also, but certainly uh, for those who don't have a neighborhood organized for us to come visit um, the Sculpture Garden on the 2nd, which is two weeks from tonight, from 5 to 8, um, be a lot of fun. And as the mayor mentioned, a good chance for the police officers and firefighters, for public safety officers to interact with the public and to continue to build on the relationships we have and uh, continue to get to know each other better through uh, an event like this. So everybody is encouraged, not only welcome, but encouraged to attend. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Mayor um, Bassett, yes. my, my question was about October's meeting. Oh, I thought you were after the No, I, I right. didn't know if there was a formal move of that meeting. Oh, um... It, I don't need yeah. a motion. I just need to know if that was the agreement that it's going to be on the 4th. That's not Tuesday all right. the 4th. Yes, October 4th. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for getting us nailed down on that. All right, board appointments. We have none. Council member reports. Benson, you want to start? I just have two things. Um, first of all, um, you know, a number of us attended the Calkins Point uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. That was, it was a great event. Uh, the... Uh, the improvements are just fantastic, and I just, um, you know, looks like a great venue for an outdoor wedding. So I'm gonna. <laughs> I may anyway. No, 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 no. I, may, <laughs> I think my daughter's always looking for an outdoor <laughs> venue. Um, but anyways, so I just wanted to uh, certainly extend my appreciation for the folks, the park staff, and um, friends of Luther Burbank, and all the other folks that made that happen. The uh, second thing is that I attended uh, the Public I Issues Committee meeting um, this past, I guess, last week. And I, I'm going to hand this, I'll give this at the end of the meeting to uh, our city manager. Uh, basically, they had a, d a discussion regarding the King County 2017-2018 budget. Uh, this was just a high-level overview, but they focused on the general fund and that they're pre predicting or projecting a $50 million deficit. Uh, right now, and what uh, the Sound Cities Association wants the cities to do, because apparently the county people have identified a number of things that they could cut to help uh, cut uh, help address the deficit, but these things would affect the cities, and they wanted to get an idea of what the different cities, what their appetite was for certain cuts. And so they're looking for input from uh, all the different cities. So I'm going to give this to our city manager, and hopefully she can share that with the council members and with staff, and be, people can weigh in. And so there will be an opportunity for all the um, PIP members to basically chime in and, you know, share what their cities have to say. So that's it. Okay. Wendy? Um, I'll just say I'm looking forward to the library's grand reopening this Saturday. See you all there. You stole it again. <laughs> it's the library board. You're supposed to be the No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, the yeah, library is opening 9.30 to speeches. Uh, one of our state senators will be speaking, one of our King County Council people, and me. So, uh, and a number of people related to the uh, library. Uh, there's a sneak preview that we've been invited to. Um, so that's exciting. I give kudos. My kudos would be in Parks Group until the summer celebration was fantastic. Um, and then we're, and that's part of the whole kickoff of summer arts uh, activities. So there's concerts in the park. And on the 28th next week, I'm introducing the band. Uh, as part of the Arts Council, but we have obviously a lot of performances. Please try to come to some, and they're uh, fantastic community events. Dan? 
So I had two meetings last week, um, Puget Sound Clean Air Agency Advisory Board. Um, one interesting, well, one, one good thing is that they've agreed for to not increase the per capita assessment for next year, so that won't that won't happen probably till 2018. Um, and secondly, they announced that um, as part of this Volkswagen settlement, the, every all the states are going to be getting pretty large chunks of money for um, to address diesel emissions and not you know completely separate and apart from the from the Volkswagen cars, um, and that there's probably over a hundred million dollars coming to the state of Washington, and that Puget Sound Clean Air Agency will have some role in in administering. Um, and what I had suggested at the at the meeting, and, and I will further I will pursue this with um, Deanna at, at Sound Cities, is the idea that this would be a great opportunity for them to work with local governments on upgrading local fleets. So to look at the heavy equipment that local governments are using and, and possibly um, um, spending money on, on new vehicles or improved vehicles or whatever kind, whatever can address diesel emissions. So hopefully something might come of that. Um, I also was at the Regional Policy Committee meeting um, where a lot of time was spent on the best starts for kids levy. Um, it is, you know, it's, I mean, the, the county has produced a 200 plus page implementation plan, um, which is mind numbing with it in its detail. And um, it's, but it's, it's, uh, it's very comprehensive and if it does, Half of what it's it's hoping to do, it would make a tremendous impact in our region. Let's see a couple things uh, from me. I guess the first, just a practical thing. Maybe I should write up earlier. But um, Carrie, you've got this CenturyLink sign-up thing. But Kirsten, we're also talking about Adam Smith's staff. Same day. Can, can we just make sure we get coordinated? So We've coordinated. We mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. There um, won't be a conflict. Okay. Then that leaves us with what do we sign up for to make sure that, uh, so do, do we just know then that 3, 4, and 5 are all okay to sign up for on this because they won't con conflict with uh, the... For those that are wanting to meet with Representative Adam Smith, though, I would recommend signing up for either a 4 o'clock start time or a 5 o'clock start time just to be on the safe side. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So that's one. Um, no one mentioned summer celebration. Uh, Jeff did. You, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you did. Um, I, I <laughs> could have. Yes, you know, you did. Uh, I just wanted to mention I enjoyed summer celebration. The uh, the chance to um, speak to and thank our veterans is always something that I enjoy, and uh, it's nice nice to have them there and leading out the parade. So uh, having a chance to say thanks for their service afterwards is something that um, is is uh, an honor. And um, saying it on behalf of the city is something that I, I certainly appreciate having the opportunity to do. Uh, and while Mercer Island may be the center of the world, I can tell you that uh, for the last week, right after summer celebration, I ducked out and had a week of completely off the grid time in central Idaho on the middle fork of the Salmon River. And it was, it was pretty much felt like a great place to be, center of the world, rather than being Mercer Island for a little while. America? So, yeah. <laughs> I might, might be able to win there. <laughs> uh, so um, back from that, I drove all night last night to get back here for this meeting, in fact. So, um, but uh, anyway, that's that's my report. No meetings that I've had uh, other, than, other than with rocks and waves and things like that on a river. So with that, unless there is anything else, we are at 9.03 adjourned.